The world's oceans are heating up at record-breaking levels. How much damage is the climate crisis causing? Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. While much attention has focused recently on the massive heat waves and flooding that have hit nations across the world, the latest climate alarm centers on rising ocean temperatures, and scientists warn the worst is likely yet to come. Last week, daily global average sea temperatures hit a record, breaking 20.96 degrees Celsius. If the trend continues, it could be devastating. Warming oceans will impact marine plant and animal life. There are concerns, too, about the effect this could have on food security in some parts of the world. Meanwhile, the U.N. Secretary General is signaling a new level of alarm over the consequences of rising temperatures. Climate change is here. It is terrifying, and it is just the beginning. The era of global warming has ended. The era, the era of global boiling has arrived. To discuss all of this, joining me now from Geneva is Mina Epps. She is the head of the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Ocean Center for Conservation Action. With us here in Washington, D.C. is Shweta Chakrabarty. She is CEO of North American Operations for the social media company We Don't Have Time. Also joining the discussion from Phoenix is Mohammed Mahmoud. He is director of the Climate and Water Program with the Middle East Institute. And from Beijing, we are joined by Cheng Hua Wu. She is China director of the Office of Jeremy Rifkin. Welcome all of you to the show. Mino, let me start with you. Ocean surface temperatures just reaching their highest ever levels. Uh, we know that the world's oceans, critically important. Talk to us about how alarming this is. Yes, and indeed, it is quite terrifying. We should really start with thinking about why the oceans are so important and what the kind of services they have already done to provide us. So they're really our life support system. So when we have warming temperatures, so we know that we have admitted a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere and the ocean has basically provided the service of absorbing the excess, not only heat, but also the CO2. So for example, if we didn't have our ocean, our planet would be 36 degrees warmer. So it has absorbed 90% of the excess heat. Now there are limits because we have tempered so much with the chemistry of the ocean towards a tipping point. So we really need to think about if we don't have a healthy ocean, it cannot help us sustain life the way we need it. So that's really the starting point. And what we're seeing is indeed alarming. Uh, the ice is melting, maybe four to five times um, more warmer water in the polar regions. And I think that this is still a fairly new concept. We're very comfortable with talking about, um, you know, heat waves on land, but we're seeing that it's happening in the ocean. And NOAA, for example, have been monitoring uh, heat waves that actually have been lurking around since the end of last year. And what marine heat waves really are, they are um, an excessive uh, mass of body, which is, has exceeded average temperature for a long period. It could be a few weeks, but it could also be up to a few years. And uh, Shweta, minus saying this is alarming, and as bad as things are, um, they actually could be getting much worse. Um, one of the experts on this, Samantha Burgess, uh, an expert in the field, was quoted as saying, the fact that we've seen the record new now makes me nervous about how much warmer the ocean may be getting between now and next March. That's when we normally see the, the heat increase. Um, can you talk to me about, if you were to tease this out, wh what are we seeing? I mean, just how bad is this? It's unprecedented heat in our oceans and on our land. And this is also being felt through really specific impacts, increased droughts, increased wildfires. The wildfires in Canada here in North America, for example, have already contributed more carbon emissions than any recorded full year of wildfire contributed carbon emissions. So it's picking up. All of this is actually picking up, which you would expect. We're at 1.3 degrees global average temperature warming, and we said we couldn't live on a planet comfortably that reaches 1.5 degrees global warming. So we are getting closer, faster to that point that we didn't want to reach or we really wanted to max out at and stabilize at. So this is exactly the type of impact that you would expect to see at this global warming temperature point. 
around the world. We just saw in the poll, my fellow panelists just was talking about the polar regions warming faster than the rest of the globe. Well, I'm sure your viewers have seen the viral footage of a home falling into rushing waters in Alaska because Alaska is part of that region of the planet that is just warming quicker than the rest of the world. And so we're seeing glaciers melt faster, resulting in glacial outbursts, flooding, and ultimately seeing a house collapse into this flooding water. So this is the kinds of events that we can anticipate uh, increasing as we continue to not take global collective action. And now's the time to do it because we're in the midst of it and we don't want it to get worse. Well, Shweta, let me ask a follow up on that because you brought up the Canadian wildfires and it's interesting. I was listening to a report on the radio uh, recently where they said, and you pointed to this, just to the, the carbon that's being released as a result of these wildfires. We know that trees absorb that carbon. In this case, it's actually contributing. And in, and in Canada's case, even more so than manufacturing in that country. And so when you look at the trees, which are supposed to absorb the carbon, and as Mina pointed out, the oceans, which are supposed to absorb all of this, um, this is also contributing, isn't it? I mean, these are supposed to be the safety valves, and they're not, right? Right. What's happening is that what would normally serve as carbon sinks, these trees and the oceans, are now instead resulting in increasing global emissions because we are we're destroying the natural filters that we have in place on the planet. In fact, the Amazon summit is happening as we speak, and it's bringing together world leaders to talk about the how we need to protect the forest and the trees specifically, like you said, in playing that role, that natural role of sinking carbon into the planet. And if we destroy that balance, now we're going to we're going to lose the natural order of things, and that will generate what we've talked about many times on this uh, program before. It'll generate more feedback loops, which will mean that there will be of even uh, further acceleration of carbon emissions happening. So what we don't want to see is too much loss of the Amazon. What we don't want to see is too much melting of the glacial ice sheets in the polar regions. These are the types of things that will result in those tipping points that we won't be able to come back from. And Mohammed, uh, we know this is a global issue, obviously. Uh, there was a documentary out called uh, Chasing Coral, which I saw back in 2017. And at that time, uh, they said that uh, in the last 30 years, we've lost about 50% of the world's coral. When you think of coral, they're, they're, it's kind of foundational to the ocean's ecosystem. And as they were saying in the documentary, then you know the small fish can go, which means the big fish could go. Um, and we could see really large ramifications from all of this. And that comes from the ocean's warming. Can you talk about that piece of it? Because food security is also tied to this. Sure, absolutely. I mean, the reality is with global warming, there's a series of cascading effects. I think uh, my fellow panelists have started to allude to that. And if we focus on the ocean side, I mean, there's the immediate impacts, right? Warmer waters, to your point, the corals are getting bleached. There's potential loss of aquaculture in terms of fish species. Uh, as certain, uh, 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 as warming occurs in different parts of uh, water bodies across the world, certain fish species can't necessarily spawn or reproduce uh, beyond certain temperature thresholds. So now you start to see uh, a slow and eventual loss of certain fish species. And as you say, uh, some marine life subsists on other marine life. And so with the increase of that loss of life at a small scale propagates further, uh, the more this phenomena increases in terms of warming. Another thing I'd like to just point out on this term of cascading effect. Yes, we're seeing extreme temperatures now. We're at the peak of things, both in air and sea. But one other point I just want to raise uh, that maybe is more of a, another consequence to human populations is the longer the oceans are warm, and certainly when you look at places or oceans or water bodies closer to the equator, that's when you could see an eventual increase and rise of more extreme weather. In the U.S. will see things more like uh, hurricanes, uh, in in uh, Western Asia, Middle East, that tends to be termed as cyclones. But these warmer waters, besides just immediately impacting uh, the marine life that's living on it, could uh, lead to manifestations of more extreme weather, cyclones, hurricanes, that have more devastating effect if and when they make landfall, and then generate all these flooding events uh, that, that we have seen in previous years. And that tends to happen closer towards the end of the summer, beginning of the fall season, because at that point, the ocean has continued to absorb all this heat and now becomes sort of uh, the prime conditions 
to generate this type of uh, uh, extreme weather activity. And Chung Wang Wu, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that as well, because uh, we're seeing the intensity of, of these storms. I mean, uh, uh, Typhoon Doksuri just had a tremendous impact on, on China and much of Asia, um, and we're seeing these uh, growing in intensity th uh, through recent years. Can you just talk to us a little bit about that? Well, we definitely are living in it at this moment, and uh, uh, we just experienced actually northern, uh, north and also northeastern part of China just experienced, um, you know, record uh, uh, rainfalls and flooding, and so we experienced more loss of lives and more damages to uh, our food system, energy system, as well as other infrastructures there and also uh, millions of people have been displaced and so we are literally experiencing it. I think as we are talking about here today, uh, more data and uh, information coming out these days, we are literally breaking records on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, monthly basis, decade basis, and sometimes even for, you know, you know, hundred year century sort of record there already. Uh, climate change, that climate is definitely changing and uh, we are experiencing more frequent, more intense, more stronger and uh, long lasting uh, extreme weather events. And the reason I think we're talking about it here, we started to understand because of the uh, emissions of global uh, greenhouse gases emissions uh, has been sort of uh, rising and that has dramatically disrupted the water cycle uh, of the planet. And uh, so for, we all know for one degree Celsius temperature rise and the atmosphere sucks 7% more humidity from the earth. And then you started to see the disruption abnorm abnormal uh, current flows, uh, jet streams. Uh, so with all the factors impacting the temperature and humidity somehow suddenly uh, went to a different direction, which we never experienced before. And uh, so we started to experience heat waves, wildfires, floods, droughts, and uh, stronger storms, and more heavy sort of uh, rainfalls there as well. Uh, I think this has become alert for everyone, particularly now uh, in East, part, yeah, you know, Southeast and East Asia at this moment. We need to figure out how to survive. And uh, we are pretty much tested uh, in terms of the limits of our survival. And we need to figure out how to address that. And in the meantime, how to take more aggressive actions to really reduce the emissions as, as much as possible. Mina, can you talk to us about El Nino, this weather pattern, and how it's contributing to this? Yes, so th thank you very much. I just wanted to kind of also um, chip in in regards to um, food security because the focus can often be on what it changes for certain you know, species, fish species, aquaculture. But the fact is that we're seeing a significant drop in the phytoplankton. And that's really kind of the basis or the energy to kind of provide um, you know, for the food, food web and the whole food system. So I think that is really significant. And also the less phytoplankton we have in our ocean, it also actually affects you know, the, the CO2 uptake. So what we're seeing now, the El Ninos and everything that's been discussed, we know that you know, they've become 50% more frequent um, in terms of the, the marine heat waves contributing to the extreme event, um, um, destroying habitat loss and species, et cetera. But the other thing is also the fact that we talk about marine heat waves. It's a fairly new concept. Before we have had the general ocean warming, but then later talked about ocean deoxygenation, um, which is also then in acidification. So the, the ocean is in effect becoming more breathless, uh, more sour and warmer, but the marine heat waves, and basically we, we talk about this as climate change multi-stressors, is also how these different impacts act together. So we need to kind of stop that. So what we need to do is we need to uh, remove the threats, uh, build resilience and enhance recovery. And we need to do that really, really, really fast in order to kind of, and unfortunately when it comes to the ocean, a lot of it is really about adaptation. So those effects that we're seeing now, I think the, the challenge we have is that we have a lot more to learn about marine heat waves than what we see on land. In terms of the monitoring, the data, we don't, it's a fairly new concept in scientific terms. So we don't have the long-term data to monitor these trends. 
So we still have a lot to learn. And the other thing is that in terms of monitoring, you can have satellite, but they only goes to a certain depth. So the average depth of the ocean is four kilometers, 4,000 meters. So, you know, we also need to really advance technologies and really help us ad adapt to what we're seeing at the moment. Uh, Minor, you talked about phyloplankton. I talked to a researcher in Greenland about this uh, last year. And it's really a fascinating uh, subject. And, and as you said, alarming, scary. I mean, you talked about acidification. Uh, we've talked about coral bleaching, ocean warming. Um, these are all out there, but, the, but it seems like they're kind of pushed to the side because we see these dramatic pictures. Uh, Shweta talked about these uh, homes being gobbled up because of the Mendenhall <laughs> glacier melting. We see the flooding. We see the wildfires. Um, this story seems like it's been kind of buried uh, when we look at the climate crisis. Yes. Um, how do you get it to, I, I hate to use the metaphor, but rise to the surface? Yeah. Yes, uh, the oceans are rising and, and so shall we. I think it's, it's really about, you know, out of sight, out of mind. I think when it comes to land, we are land creatures, we are terrestrial animals. So basically this is where we live and that's why we can relate to it and it's alarming. I think that what we've seen in the past few years is really the increased political, I mean, not only political, um, but also the public awareness about the important role of our ocean in terms of generating oxygen. Uh, you know, it's really our climate regulator. It's, it's really our life support system. So I think that how can we, and now we're talking about things like, um, you know, the green transitioning to save our climate and therefore needed the need to go to the deep sea to, to mine for minerals. Well, as we know that the, you know, the seabed floor actually is the, is the largest carbon storage that we have on our planet. So do we really want to disrupt that? Or can we rethink? So not only cutting emissions, but also think about what do we need to electrify our society? Can we come up with alternative? Can we reuse? Can we recycle? Um, in recycle? So we really need to have this transformative change in how we think and value the ocean because we, we, we don't want the ocean to continue to provide the services of just absorbing CO2 because it's killing it and it's killing the ecosystem and species and it has already seen detrimental effects. So, um, but we are seeing that, you know, major historical milestones have been achieved in terms of multilateral uh, agreement and what we need to protect the ocean and realizing its important role. So, I mean, we notably to protect 30% of not just land and seas, but the wider ocean uh, beyond national jurisdiction, which is two thirds of our planet. Um, there is an internationally legally binding treaty uh, to actually protect biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. That's just on the surface, we say that it's 70% of our planet, but in volume, it's as much as 95%. So this is really high time, you know, also for the high seas and to recognize it and really contribute because marine protection is climate action. Um, uh, our fellow panelists talked about, you know, the, the, the Amazon, et cetera, but mangrove forests are much, much, much more uh, efficient in absorbing and sequestering carbon carbon dioxide. So we need to really, again, remove the threats, build resilience and enhance recovery. Because the irony is that what we call nature is our best ally to fight climate change. But the irony is that these nature-based solutions are at risk of climate change themselves. And so, Mohammed, uh, COP28 is coming up in November in, in Dubai. Uh, should this be this issue be taking center stage? It should. You know, I've always argued uh, in terms of the COP meeting's agenda. You know, yes, what tends to dominate the the agenda is usually the energy transition, climate mitigation. How do you reduce emissions? And rightfully so. That's how you directly address the issue of climate change. When it comes to these other topics that uh, I think was correctly labeled as under adaptation, I've always pushed to have water, water resources, oceans, things that affect our water resource systems be high up on the agenda. And we tend to sometimes skip that and go straight to food security. You know, we see food security as part of the agenda, which of course is also important, but water security is also food security absent sufficient water resources on land to enable us to live and, and, and persist in cities and, and terrestrial environments and provide water for food production, industrial growth, energy production. Uh, 
we would not be where we are today. And similarly, I'd argue the oceans also play a role in that. In fact, for a, lo a large number of nations, uh, coastal nations, certainly uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, for example, rely on the oceans as a source of additional water augmentation through desalination. Um, and that's just one of the many, uh, many gifts, I would say, that the oceans give us, certainly as, uh, as our, our panelists all alluded, uh, it's a protection mechanism uh, for us in terms of how we deal with climate change, but also provides us many boons and gifts in terms of our ability to live and persist on this planet. So water resources, ocean issues, as a form of adaptation and the various strategies that fall under that should always be high on the agenda for these climate conference meetings. And Chung Wal Wu, the UN Secretary General, of course, has made uh, climate a, a central theme uh, and he keeps pushing on this. He's calling on leaders to act. He's been saying that for some time. I want to, to listen to appeal for action uh, from uh, Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres. Let's listen to him and I want to get your reaction on the other side. The air is unbreathable the heat is unbearable, and the level of fossil fuel profits and climate inaction is unacceptable. Leaders must lead. No more hesitancy, no more excuses, no more waiting for the others to move first. There is simply no more time for that. Chung Wawu, uh, leaders must lead, he says. Uh, when we think about that, obviously, we turn our attention to the two biggest emitters, the United States and China. We know that Secretary Kerry was just in Beijing meeting with his counterpart there on the climate issue. Uh, can these two countries, which really did kind of take the lead in the Paris uh, Agreement, can they lead the rest of the world on this issue? It's a question mark, and uh, even though both countries have been taking a lot of actions in terms of advancing clean energy transition, uh, but somehow in reality, the current uh, relationship between the two largest uh, economies is not really helpful at all. It's not encouraging because everything is politicized. Climate change is politicized and geopoliticized. So I doubted very much that the two will really come together in a very constructive, productive way, particularly at the global level leading up to COP28. I think that's a bigger question mark on the table we need to figure out. A couple of things, actually, I want to uh, bring up. Uh, I know, as we're talking about the, the, the warming of the oceans with all the complexities of the, all the issues, crisis from all dimensions there, but we also know Continue, continue the rise of greenhouse gas emissions has to be addressed as quickly as possible, particularly for largest economies. So to a certain extent, I think that should be one of the reserve-focused you know, issues, priorities actually, for particular G20. Uh, they need, the largest economy, economies need to really take immediate actions to advance clean energy as much as, as quickly as possible. But of course, in the meantime, we do need to look into adaptation, justice issue, compensation issue, loss and damages there. So to a certain extent, I started to get really worried about what will come out of COP28 uh, because of the complexity of the issues there. We still need to figure out how to make sure we get all the dimensions, the complexity of the issues into the global process so that we'll be address them effectively at the same time. And Shweta, she makes a really good point. Uh, this is complex, as you well know, uh, but Gutierrez says leaders must lead. What type of leadership would you like to see? I mean, what are the solutions out there that they should be advancing? Well, President Biden's historic climate legislation ha was, was really what America needed to be able to step back into COP27 and lead by example. That is at risk in the next election cycle. And Nobody knows this better than voters in the United States, but those who are watching closely to what's happening here in the United States to see, will our two-party system result in Republicans coming back in power? And we know that the Republicans are not interested in furthering climate solutions and supporting legislation on climate or even recognizing climate. So it is so critical that the United States continues to support existing legislation and future legislation that the Democrats are behind. And we know that 70 percent of voters in the United States, which includes Republicans, more than 50 percent, 51 percent of Republicans say that regulation on climate is needed. So we need to ensure that the next election cycle continues to keep Democrats in power so that America can lead on the global stage. That's coming up now at Climate Week New York. We're going to see several representatives from the United States and around the world show up 
uh, in ahead of COP28, where world leaders will gather in Dubai to continue to progress pledges and implementation of these pledges. But I agree with my fellow panelists that we it's a question mark as to whether or not we are going to meet what we know science is saying is is absolutely urgent in terms of implementing the actual solutions, the actual funds, the actual aid that is needed to protect our planet to the extent possible. So we need to ensure that at least domestically, the, lead, the correct leadership is in place. Same thing with China, same thing with India, which is hosting the G20, which is coming up as well, and that these leaders come together at COP28 and really commit and showcase through implementation that the pledges can come into fruition. Mina, uh, we're talking about leadership, but uh, I'd like maybe also to talk a little bit about storytelling, because this weekend I saw a story in Phoenix where uh, a woman was showing how she has mittens in her car that she has to put on before she can hold the wheel because it's just so hot it would burn her hands. Uh, we, we talked about the Mendenhall Glacier melting up in Alaska and homes being chewed up there. Uh, Shweta talked about, uh, you know, the fires in Canada. You know, we keep hearing all these separate stories, but they're all really one story, aren't they? I mean, we keep talking about the climate crisis is coming. It's this oncoming freight train. It's actually arrived in many respects. And we have this story, that story, and that story. If you connect the dots, um, it's, it's illustrating that. Are we doing a, a poor job of telling this story, do you think? Yeah, I did. I think specifically when it comes to the ocean, because it's so it's out of sight, out of mind, and it's really hard to kind of relate to unless you are, you know, maybe living by the coast or, you know, using it for recreational purposes. But I want us also to think about, I mean, you talked about the U.S. election coming up, etc., and also the geopolitics that come into play. And I have to say that, you know, geopolitics have no space in, you know, how we actually manage our common resources. So the, the more we can get the message through that we are, we, are, we are all connected and the ocean actually connects us all. And even if you're a landlocked country or you're in a state in the middle of America, you're still are being, you're still benefiting from the services that the ocean is providing. So I think that even though we're talking about national politics, international politics, it, you know, multilateralism has a key role to play here because these are global pro problems and we need global solutions. And we need the leadership, not the least from, you know, two really large emerging, you know, uh, sorry, economies uh, to really also step up and lead the way and we could follow. I think that the one caution that I think that we need to be careful with, which we have a tendency to do, I mean, now we have exploited our resources on land and now we're going to the sea. Yeah. I think one thing that worries me, but also with the, uh, looking at the, the climate COP um, in, in UAE, which is coming up in November, December this year, is really like they're looking to the ocean as the solution to climate change. We're not just talking climate change adaptation, but also mitigation. And in fact, we don't, we need to change our uh -huh. system, financial system, and not right. actually look at the ocean as a major dumping ground for CO2, oh. um, you know, even in areas beyond yeah. national jurisdiction. Right. So I think that we need to really be cautious in terms of, you know, what solutions uh, we are looking at when it comes to the ocean oh. and managing those trade-offs. All right, we're gonna have to leave it there. We've run out of time, but thank you very much for a great discussion, really appreciate it. That's gonna do it for our broadcast. Thanks so much for joining us.